I want to thank you for praying. We just sensed, and it was interesting to kind of see what other churches were doing across the country, um, kind of moving into the summer months and moving into summer months, moving into these fall months, just recognizing that we as followers of Jesus, we needed to lead the way in culture in helping to change the conversation and to uh, j- just do what, like, what can we do to change some of the negativity and just this heavy weight and feeling of culture? What can we do? What we Jesus followers can do is we can pray. And so thank you for praying. Um, it is not just our church. It is churches around the nation as well. We are praying because, um, well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait until Wednesday morning. <clears throat> I mean, we may not know who is elected, but I can't wait to watch TV and not hear another campaign advertisement for at least a month. <laughs> Who's with me? Yeah, see, you're celebrating, right? No more hearing about who our enemies are. It's going to be great. It's going to be great because things are, man, things are awkward. So last night, right, had costumes on, and we we're like, we're driving around a couple of friends' houses, and uh, one of our kids said, yeah. Do you think trick-or-treating is going to be weird this year because of all the politics? And uh, yeah, it was kind of weird. It was kind of weird. uh, Yeah, so um, so we're going through our neighborhood, right? And um, go up to a house in our neighborhood, and there's a large Vote Biden sign in the front yard. And so we go up to the, the, to the door, and the kids ring the doorbell, and a guy comes to the door, and trick-or-treat, and uh, we well, didn't have anything in his hands. I was like, this is kind of awkward. And he said, um, children, I'm not giving away my own candy this year. Um, my neighbor's very wealthy. I'm giving away his candy this year. Uh, so you can go to his house and just take some extra. I give permission to do that. Uh, wow, okay. So we go to the neighbor's house, and uh, there's a large vote Trump sign in his yard. And I was like, wow, I, I hope they get along better than I'm imagining, but okay. And uh, we go to the door, kids ring the doorbell, and so comes the door, trick or treat, and uh, well, he doesn't have any candy either, and he looks at the kids and says, kids, I'm not giving you any candy, if you want candy, get a job and work for it, get your own candy. And so, man, things are just, things are weird, it's really weird, really, really weird, okay? All right, good, you at least appreciated, maintain my policy of offending everyone, we're good. Uh, So five weeks ago, I challenged you to pray for five minutes every day for 40 days. Some of you are old pros, and that has not been a problem at all. You prayed for five minutes, your prayers naturally turned into 10 minutes. For some of you, they prayed, they turned into an hour because you are mature, discipled Christians who just pray and pray and pray. For others of you, this five minutes was a challenge. Like, like you pray regularly, maybe even pray every day, but they're more kind of like those emergency throw them up to the Lord kind of prayers. And so even kind of learning the habit of, of seeking the Lord every day and, and then seeking the Lord and praying for five minutes straight has been a challenge for you. But good job for you. You have worked it and you have learned. And, and here, here's been the goal, right? I don't know what you're going to do after this, but I hope that you will think to yourselves, okay, how can I turn this 40-day experiment into a regular daily spiritual practice because it's going to be good for me. I've already read some of the, some of the replies that have come in. You've done a good job with that. Um, so, and so, so we ask the question, how have you grown deeper or closer to God in your pray today experience? And if, if you didn't, uh, there's still some time to uh, send, in, send in your responses, send in your, uh, your own stories. Maybe we can kind of throw that up there again. But let me just read a couple of them that have... Uh, that have come in, and by the way, good, good job. We've, uh, I'm already seeing several of the texts come in of people telling us the time and t- time and day that you're going to be here praying. It's awesome. Thank you for doing that. I've got to sort through those and find the stories that came in. That's great. Um, here we go. Let me find one. Uh, here's a good one, okay? The subtle reminder to turn to God first and turn to prayer first before trying to accomplish any daunting task myself. Isn't that a good reminder? Isn't that a good lesson for all of us to learn, right? That natural idol of self-sufficiency that we think we can do it on our own, but rather to turn to God first and learn that He is there. He can do it so much better than we can. It's going to be a good job, good job. How How about any others? Let me just check and see. Here's another one here. Come on. It's given me hope knowing that I'm praying for my friends and my family. God is good. He is so good to me, and he has blessed me even in my time of need. 
See, we're learning how to pray. It's good. Oh, this is great. What other? Let me see. All right. There we go. Hey, you keep sending them in, and if we... Uh, if I can remember by before the end here, I'm going to read a few more of those. Thank you for praying today. Um, so, so, so today, as we kind of conclude this series, let me ans- let's, let's ask this question today. How long should I pray? So, so in other words, like, why five minutes? Is there something biblical? Is there something extra spiritual? Um, why five minutes? Well, no, there's nothing magical. There's nothing mystical or extra spiritual about five minutes. There's as far as I know, there's nothing in the Bible that says something great happens when you pray five minutes versus four minutes. So why, why, why pray about five minutes? Well, it's just a simple challenge. It's a simple uh, habit and an exercise to, to, to push ourselves more than just kind of one minute, but to actually be a little bit doable. But, but the question is, is valid. Like, how long should I pray? And here's what I want you to think about, even as we try to respond to that, answer that question today. There is something about prayer that is not completely rational and logical. In many ways, when we talk about prayer, in many ways, it doesn't, like make, it doesn't make sense in the terms of being able to just like rationally, logically lay it all out there. So, so let, me, let me illustrate it like this. Jesus is uh, he's, he's, he's preaching and teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives, gives, um, gives the disciples and gives us the Lord's Prayer. But look what he says right before that as he gets into the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. He says, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Okay, now if we think about this just purely logically and rationally, okay, here's what he says. Your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ever ask it of Him. And so thinking logically, we have to say, okay, if he's our father in heaven and he knows what we need, why does he make us ask him in the first place? If he knows what we need and he is a good heavenly father, shouldn't a good heavenly father just give us what we need, provide what we need? I mean, it's not just knows what you want, it's what you need. Shouldn't he just provide it for us without having to ask? And yet he tells us to pray. And then what he tells us to pray, he says, but, but because your father knows what you need before you ask, you don't have to use a lot of words. You don't have to keep babbling on like the pagans who think that the more words I use, the more likely God is to answer my prayers. And then he just lays out the Sermon on the Mount, which is a very simple prayer outline. He just, it, basically, he says, look, when you pray, just keep it simple. You could just praise God for who he is. You thank God for what he has done. You ask him for what you need. Say amen. Keep it simple. You don't need lots of prayer. To which you might respond, I can do that in 30 seconds. I don't need five minutes. And so we can already see that there's something about prayer that's not exactly logical or rational all the time. In some ways, it doesn't make sense. But but then we read another story about prayer, another teaching about prayer that comes from the, the Gospel of Luke, again from Jesus in which he seems to kind of contradict himself. He seems to say something that's a little bit, I mean, almost opposite of what he said before. Luke chapter 18, starting verse 1. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, he's going to tell a little story here, just imagine this. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. End of the story. It's an interesting story to tell, to try to teach people to always pray and not give up. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, 
He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So Jesus tells this little story, and it tells us that the intention of the story, the intention of the parable, is to teach us to pray and never give up. And then he tells the weirdest little story, right, about a judge who is, who, 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 who just, he doesn't care about people at all. He's only in it for the money and the power. And so this poor, powerless widow comes to him, and she needs help. And so he ignores her because he doesn't really care about people or justice. And so she comes to him, and, and he doesn't pay attention to her. So she comes back the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And finally, because he's just getting tired of her and getting worn down, he gives her what, he want, what she wants. And Jesus says, that's a story to teach you about prayer, to teach you to pray and never give up, to which we think, wait, what? You mean we just have to wear God down and eventually he'll get so sick and tired of us praying the same prayer over and over, he'll give us what we want just to shut us up? No. Because it's a parable, not an allegory. You see, you see a parable is a short, simple story that only illustrates one point and that's it. And the one point, nothing else, is pray and never give up like the widow. It's not an allegory. In an allegory, every little detail in the story represents something of spiritual truth. It's, it's not an allegory, okay? So God is not like the judge. In fact, God is the opposite of the judge. But he says, listen to the heart of the widow. Learn from the habit of the widow who came back day after day after day after day after day after day. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. I mean, she you pray. She requested. She asked. She got justice finally. How long should I pray? As long as it takes. And maybe there's the, the little key is when Jesus says here, however, when the Son of Man comes, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Will I find faithfulness? Will I find you praying and praying and praying and praying? So how long should I pray? As long as it takes. Now, somehow we have to kind of put these two teachings together. Don't use a lot of words. God already knows what you need before you pray. Pray as long as it takes. All right, so let's, let's ask the question. Why does, te- why does Jesus teach us to pray so long? Okay? Well, like we said, it is not because God needs to be bribed, worn down, convinced, um, or because he's evil. It's not any of those things. The Bible doesn't really tell us exactly, and so, so I'm going to be honest here. These are, these are kind of like, these are my, my best guesses and talking to people who are well-schooled in the school of prayer and wisdom. This just kind of seems to be kind of what collective wisdom would tell us. Why does Jesus teach us to pray for so long? Maybe it is because God wants to know how badly we want it. Maybe God being that heavenly father who already knows what we need He wants us to learn, and he wants us to pray. Maybe God wants to know how bad you really want it, just like good parents when our kids come to us and they say that they want something. And in our minds, we're like, yeah, it'd be fun to give that to you. I want to go get that to you. I want you to have that as well. But how badly do you want it? And so we just kind of say, okay, well, we'll think about that, or maybe, or we'll see, which I'm told in our house, when dad says we'll see, it basically means no. But um, I, I have to work against that one sometimes. But sometimes we're just waiting to see, right, moms and dads, like, how badly do you really want it? And if they never bring it up again, they didn't really want it all that bad. It was just a whim. It was just kind of emotion. It was that day. Their friend had it. They thought they wanted one, too. If I had given it to them, they would have played with it for an hour and never got get used ever, ever again. So I don't want to do that. How badly do you want it? And when they keep bringing it up again and again and again and again, and it lasts, then we can help to identify maybe they really do truly want it that bad. Maybe God, in his wisdom, lets us pray and pray and pray and pray, asking himself, how badly do they really want it? Or maybe he wants us to realize how badly we really want it. And so what it is that you've been praying for, do you want it badly enough to pray every day as long as it takes? Because I'm, I just, I, I mean, I, I love you, but let me just challenge you for a minute. If you're only willing to pray one day and you kind of forget about it, you don't really want it all that badly. Why did Jesus teach us to pray so long? Maybe it's because God wants to build spiritual strength in the process. 
Could it be that the practice of prayer is an exercise which, like lifting weights done over time, extended periods of time, will actually build those spiritual muscles? And that the more you pray, the longer you pray, the more regularly you pray, you build those spiritual muscles, you build spiritual strength. Um, Again, maybe it's like parenting, right? Why is it that as parents, we don't buy our 16-year-old brand new driver's licensed children the fastest, best sports car that we can because they would love it? You know why we don't? Because we know they're not ready for it. They don't have the maturity. Even if we could afford it, we couldn't afford the insurance. Even if we could afford all of it, we wouldn't because we love them, we care about them. They don't have the experience. They don't have the maturity. They don't have the knowledge. They I'm, I'm sorry, guys. You, you, you just don't, right? They'd go get in a wreck, smash up the car, hurt themselves, hurt somebody else, and so we give them an old junker to learn on. So God answers our prayers and he gives us old junkers to learn on. No, 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 no. Maybe God wants us to pray long enough to build those spiritual muscles so that in the process, when he gives us the answer to our prayer, we're mature enough to handle it. We don't waste the opportunity. See, people read things in the scripture all the time like, whatever you want, pray, and if you pray with faith, God will give it to you. And people say, I prayed for a million dollars a lot, and God has yet to give me that million dollars. And maybe one of the best ways God can answer that prayer is to say no, because if he gave you a million dollars, it would ruin you, or you'd waste it. I I mean, I firmly believe God would love to give every one of us a million dollars, but he knows that we're not ready to handle it. And could it be that in the process of praying over and over and over and over and over, we not only become convinced just how badly we want it, but we build the spiritual strength and fortitude to handle the blessing when he sends it our way. And so we pray, and we pray, and we pray. If you were Jewish, you might hear your parents and elders say something like, did you know that our our ancestor Jacob walked with a limp? And there's this ancient story that I believe can really help us, can kind of give us an image today, a picture in our minds of, of what it means to pray and to pray and to pray and never give up. Here, here's, here's, here's how the story goes. So Jacob was the spiritual ancestor of the Jewish people. His, his name literally means the trickster. And in one of his worst moments in life, he defrauds his older brother out of the rights of the older brother and, and kind of defrauds him out of the inheritance that the older brother gets because he lies to him, tricks him out of it, gets him in a moment of weakness. His brother, as you can imagine, is furious, especially in that time because he has ruined his future. And his brother vows that he will kill Jacob. Jacob runs away. He goes to, uh, goes to another relative in a land far away where his brother will not run after him to get him where he'll find some protection. There he lives for a couple of decades. There he continues his process, and while he's there, he tricks his uncle out of some of his property and sheep and etc. His uncle tricks him in return for the wives that he marries, and everybody's defrauding everybody, okay? You got to read the Bible. It's so crazy. If you think your family's messed up, you read the Bible, you'll discover you got nothing on the stories of the Bible, okay? Jacob... Decades later, decides it's time to return home, and he's nervous. He's scared that his brother still is out to get him. So he returns home with his wives, with his children, with his flocks, and the night before he's supposed to meet his brother, he goes on ahead all by himself, and he camps out all by himself. He doesn't sleep very well that night because a stranger walks into his camp. Jacob, being the classic trickster who never lets anybody get anything over on him, he's a fighter. And so this stranger walks into his campsite in the middle of the night. He doesn't know who it is, but he's not letting anybody get anything on him. And he fights him, and they begin a wrestling match, a fight that lasts all night long. This this stranger, he's stronger than anyone Jacob's ever fought because usually Jacob wins every match he's ever fought. Nobody gets anything over on him. This stranger maybe seemingly has some spiritual power, some unique powers, the strongest kind of a, he's a man, but maybe not really a man. In fact, as the fight goes on and morning gets closer and closer, just before dawn, the story tells us that, that, that whether out of extreme physical, like extreme like medical knowledge and ability, or like some special kung fu training or something like that, or just some spiritual power, he touches Jacob's hip in just the right place, dislocates his hip as a way to harm him and to, and to, and to injure him and to slow him down, but it seems like it doesn't really do anything to stop him. Jacob holds on, and he is not going to lose this match. He's never lost a fight ever in his life. Finally, the sun rises, 
And this stranger realizes it is time for him to get out of there. And so he says, let go of me. The sun has risen. The fight is over. Let go of me. And Jacob says, no. You're going to give me a blessing. You've got something. You've got some connection. You've got some spiritual power. You've got something in their culture. And in our culture, a blessing doesn't really mean a whole lot. In their culture, a blessing was everything. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you pronounce a blessing over me. The man says, what's your name? He says, my name's Jacob. That's right, trickster, and I got you. And the man looks at him and says, your name is no longer Jacob. Your new name will be Israel, which means he struggles with God. Jacob lets go. And he's like, I don't know who you are or what you are, but I've struggled with God. And the story wraps up by saying, so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And the sun rose. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Was it an angel? Was it God? Was it a pre-existent Jesus showing up in some kind of bodily form? The image I want you to see in this story is that sometimes prayer is a struggle. Sometimes prayer is a wrestling match. Sometimes prayer is a fight in which you are fighting for what you want most. Now, now, again, it's not an allegory. Don't take it too far. Am I wrestling against God? Am I wrestling against the devil? It's not about who you're wrestling against. It's about the fact that you are wrestling. And the prayer, heavy, long prayer, that is not just a quick prayer with a quick, easy answer, is sometimes like a wrestling match, especially for the things you want the most. And you're wrestling, and you're wrestling, and wrestling. And the question is, how long will you wrestle? You wrestle until the light shines. Not just a quick prayer. Not just tell, tell God what you need, leave it up to Him, then go on your way, go to work, hang out with your friends, binge watch your favorite show on Netflix. No, 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 no. If you want it bad enough, you contend in prayer, you wrestle in prayer, you fight in prayer, and you pray. If it literally means you pray all night long until the light comes, you pray literally all night until the light comes. If it means you pray and pray and pray until you have, as we sometimes say in the old days, you pray through, you pray until you pray through, and you don't stop until the light shines. I mean, think about this. Sometimes we talk about the difference. We contrast darkness versus light. And we, th- we, we say that like confusion is like living in the dark. And if you are confused and you don't know which way to turn, you wrestle in prayer and you wrestle in prayer and you wrestle in prayer and you contend in prayer until the light shines and you have clarity. We say that sin reigns in the darkness. And if you're struggling with sin and if there's sin in your life or sin around you, you wrestle with the darkness, you wrestle with the darkness and you pray and you pray and you contend until the light of God's truth and forgiveness shines. That anger and rage and fighting and dissension and jealousy and all that, and all that relational garbage, it reigns in the darkness. How long do you pray? You pray and you wrestle and you contend until the light of forgiveness, reconciliation, peace, resolution comes your way. How long should I pray? You pray until the light shines. I remember I was a sophomore at the university and was nearing the end of a semester and I was leading a ministry in which we would go out to churches on the weekends, especially usually small churches, and we'd bring a team of us and <clears throat> we'd do kids ministry and youth ministry on Saturday night. We'd try to take over all the kids' youth ministry, even adult Sunday school classes on Sunday morning. We'd lead worship, we'd preach, we'd just kind of do all the ministry for a church and it was, our, it was our way to just bless a church with some youthful energy and to bring encouraging word of the Lord and really good ministry experience for us as well. And so it was, it was a fun ministry, really enjoyed it, but we were getting near the end of the semester and finals were coming and final term papers were coming and the ministry was struggling and some people were kind of failing in their commitments and dropping out and I was discouraged and frustrated and stressed. And so I remember one day I went to the prayer chapel on campus. And I knelt before, went up to the prayer altar and I just knelt and I prayed and I cried out to God. I said, God, I can't do this. People are quitting. I've got so many deadlines and pressures of my own. God, I can't do this anymore. God, I can't do this. And I just prayed and cried and prayed and poured out my heart and 
And then all of a sudden, the light shined. Then, I mean, you, you, you see, you can't control this. You can't time it. You, you just pray as long as it takes, but then the light shined. There was a sense of release in which I sense God saying, I've got this. It's going to be okay. I got up. There was a peace. This, this like proverbial weight was lifted. It was going to be okay. A couple of days later, a couple of other students came and said, hey, what's this ministry you guys are doing? We'd like to know from more information about it. And they came to our Monday night meeting and they said, we want to be a part of it. We want to go on the next trip. And they were influencers on the campus and brought a couple others with them. And the ministry began to move forward with new life. We had a great year of ministry. What I remember was that moment of wrestling in prayer. And I prayed until the light shined. Throughout the series, I've tried to share stories of powerful, big movements of God. In the past, in our own country and other countries. And, well, I've heard several times a story of one of our sister churches in Cali, Colombia. Back in the 80s, the pastor who was there, Adalberto Herrera, he had been working hard, ministering well, serving for five, six years, and he was discouraged. Things weren't going well. People weren't being reached. Lives weren't being changed. He, he, was, he was trying to be faithful to God, but just nothing was happening. He was so discouraged and frustrated. He went to the Lord and he said, Lord, you got to give me a vision for ministry because I don't know if I can do this much longer if nothing's going to happen. God, give me a vision for ministry. And he sensed God giving him a one-word vision. He said, pray. So Pastor Herrera and his wife, and three Elderly ladies in the church in their 80s, they began to gather on Tuesday mornings from 4 a.m. till 6 a.m. and they just prayed. And they prayed every Tuesday morning, 4 to 6 a.m. They prayed. They prayed for God to do what only He could do. They prayed for God to work and to change lives and to save people's lives and transform people's lives. And what do you know? People started showing up. People started giving their hearts and lives to Jesus. They didn't stop praying because now they had a bunch of work to do. They continued to pray every Tuesday morning and more people decided to join the prayer meeting and they continued to pray every Tuesday morning from 4 till 6 a.m. praying that God would move and work and more people showed up and more people showed up. They'd have extra services in the building. But several years later, they would have like a thousand people show up. They'd have a worship service. They said, you guys got to go because the next crowd has come in. They'd fill it all up again. They said, you guys got to go in five services on Sundays. Well, I just, I just looked it up. They have some like 15,000 people showing up on the weekends. I know numbers aren't everything for sure, but I mean, that's 15,000 people who are following Jesus. Their lives are transformed. They're living for Jesus. They'll regularly have 1,000 people show up on Tuesday morning at 4 a.m. to pray together. And they look back and say, when did God start moving? He started moving when we started praying. When the pandemic hit for them, they began to give and to serve in their community. I saw a news report that they helped 2,000 families with bags of food serve 3,800 hot meals to people in their community. They're reaching out and they're still praying. They said, let's not only pray on Tuesday mornings, but let's add a morning of fasting and prayer as well. And so every week there's a morning of fasting and prayer. And they're seeking God as a church family, praying for God to do what only God can do. What does it look like for you when you pray to not just pray quick and easy prayers, but to wrestle and contend for what you want the most. Why does God teach me to pray so long? Maybe because God is trying to change me. Because what we discover about prayer is God not only changes others and situations, and He does, but quite often, the one God wants to change the most is me. The timing of our 40 days of prayer has been to coincide with the national elections. It has been my hope and my prayer that we would have something more to do than talk, complain, and endlessly post things on social media that really doesn't change anybody's minds. It has been my goal that God would remind us that God cares that we would learn that God moves in His power and that God's power can affect 
the outcome of elections. God cares about who leads on all levels. It has been my goal for us to really consider the state of our nation, the state of our culture. Instead of complaining, to pray. And yes, I'm excited for Wednesday. No more political ads, at least for a month until the next election cycle starts up again. The reality is we might not even know who has been elected on Wednesday morning. I don't know what this week's going to look like. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray and to pray and to pray some more. And one of the biggest things that can happen, one of the biggest questions we haven't really asked yet, but I think we've got to ask is, how do I want to conduct myself starting Wednesday morning, November 4th? No matter what the outcome is, all the votes will have been cast at that point. How do I want to conduct myself starting Wednesday morning? Regardless of who's elected, whether your candidate wins or loses, I believe how you and I act. I mean, it's been true this whole time, okay? But let's just, let's just bump to Wednesday. Regardless of whether your guy won or lost, how you act on Wednesday morning, how you speak to people, how you treat to people, what you decide to post and share on your favorite social media channel, how you and I act on Wednesday morning and on, it matters. It influences the people around us who are considering whether they should follow Jesus or not. So let's pray, and let's pray, and let's pray. Let's pray until the light comes. Two more days. 48 hours of prayer starting tonight. 6 p.m., our middle school students, high school students, and prayer partners, they're going kick to kick it off for us. And they're going to pray, and they're going to pray, and they're going to pray. And students, thank you so much for being bold. I love it that you guys are not just learning about prayer, but that you're praying and you're doing it. It's awesome, guys. Lead the way. Kick us off strong, okay? You guys can do it. I believe in it. I believe you can. Pray until the light comes. And then at 8 p.m., whoever's on the schedule to kick us off the 48 hours, you're going to show up here at the sanctuary, and you're going to pray and to pray and to pray, and then someone else is going to come at 9 p.m. By the way, you don't have to sign up just to be here. Now, I really want us to have all 48 hours filled with someone, at least one person who's going to be here. But if you didn't sign up for a spot or you have one hour, you can come up to the church anytime. It's going to be open those whole 48 hours. What if on Tuesday, nights, ra Tuesday night, rather than being glued to the TV to, to listen to every opinion in the world, what if we just gathered and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed? What if people stuck around till midnight on Tuesday night? I'm not going to lock the doors if we're here praying. As long as there's somebody here praying, the doors are going to be unlocked, the lights are going to stay on. What if we pray and pray and pray for these 48 hours? Didn't sign up yet? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, we got that there. I've got a lot of text already. I believe we're going to have our church, and we're going to pray, we're going to pray, and let's pray until the light comes. I'm going to invite the band to come on back. Let's, let's conclude our time together today, not just with a quick song and then to leave, but let's take a moment to indeed pray. What I really want you to consider today is this. How has your witness for Christ been for the last 40 days? And what would you like for your witness of Christ to be for the next 40 days? On Wednesday morning, regardless of any outcomes, regardless of what happens around you, how do you want to live and to act? And what do you want to be remembered for by how you live starting Wednesday morning. Let's stand.